Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart always be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter. It is the Sunday after Ascension Day, which we commemorated on Thursday evening, marking Christ's ascension to the right hand of God the Father 40 days after Resurrection Sunday. And this is another day when we gather for worship following a mass shooting in the United States of America. That is precisely why Pam and I are wearing orange stoles. Orange seems to, I, I still have to learn a little bit more about this, but orange is the liturgical color for gun violence awareness. I, e I emailed a colleague of mine Tuesday night. I, I knew that he had an orange stole, and I asked him where to get them, and I emailed this person who lives out of Washington, D.C., I think it is, and she said, I just happened to make a whole bunch of them up. Several of you were remarking beforehand how beautiful they are, and they are. But isn't it horrible that we have to have something like this? And yet here we are. Hopefully, Pam and I won't have to wear these ever again. But, you know, so I mentioned it's, we're in that in-between time between the Feast of the Ascension. Pentecost is next Sunday, and I invite you to look first at page 884. I want to take us to that Ascension story, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. And Christ, who has been raised for 40 days, has ascended, as I said, to the right hand of God the Father. And it's not so much vertical, but I, I think the better way to understand this, theologians say, is to uh, try to conceptualize how Christ disperses throughout all of creation. The bottom line is Christ, at this point, with his 11 apostles, Judas has gone to do what he's gone to do. And, you know, in a few more sentences, they'll have the first bishop's election in the church. But what's happened here is Christ has left the apostles and the disciples and he's not going to be as present with them, or not present with them as he was before. God relates to the church, if you will, in a different way. And whenever relationships change and take on new dynamics, there's, there's a level of grief, that things aren't the way that they used to be, but also there's that sense of expectation and hope, which will be realized in a more full sense once we get to Pentecost. But if we imagine the disciples standing where they were and Christ ascending, they're watching this, but they're also sensing a range of emotions, one of which was likely grief. And in grief, one of the things that can happen is that we can freeze, which is exactly what 
the apostles did. They just stood there still, trying to wrap their minds around what was happening and probably not even thinking yet of what they were supposed to do next. And so here come two men in white. They're really messengers from God. They're angels. And they say to the apostles, why are you standing still? Get on with it. Start doing the things that Jesus taught you to do. Yes, you're going to relate to Jesus, to God, to the Holy Spirit in a different way, but you have a task before you. See, this is where I think the story of Jesus still applies for us today. It's not something that happened 2,000 years ago, which is ancient history. Yes, it was 2,000 years ago, but we trust that God is still present with us in Christ through the Holy Spirit. God is still working through us. Did you hear me say that? God is working through us. One of you mentioned before the service that, and, and maybe more than one of you is, is thinking this, that why can't God just come down and fix all this? And that's, that's a genuine prayer. But here's the thing about God. Here's the thing about how God dignifies humanity. And here's the thing about the church. God is calling on us to take action here. We hear it. Don't just stand there. Don't, don't just stand there doing nothing. Get to work. So that's where we're going to springboard. Here's how I've thought about this throughout the week since, since Tuesday evening. And it, I included it in the email, and then I printed some up um, out there, a list of the scripture references that I'll be working from today. If you didn't pick one of those up, I'll, I'll, I'll go slowly, if you will. But there's an incident in all four Gospels. It's where the authorities come to arrest Jesus. And Violence ensues. Well, we still have violence today. Weapons were a little bit different back then. This references swords. And, you know, it's funny, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention which, um, which apostle actually drew blood, but John mentioned, oh, it was Peter. See, I think the two of them had something, a little bit of friction, because in John's Gospel at the end, he talks about racing Peter to the empty tomb. So there may have been a little healthy or unhealthy competition. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say nothing about who it was. But John, oh yeah, that was Peter. Peter drew his sword. He drew blood from Malchus. He cut off Malchus's ear. You know, I'm thinking this is a little bit tangential, but we're here, we hear a lot of arguments right now about the Second Amendment. Don't change the Second Amendment and X, Y, and Z. Let me tell you something. I don't care about the Second Amendment. If someone claims to be a baptized follower of Jesus Christ, there is a higher standard than the Constitution of the United States of America. It doesn't matter what those folks outside the church might think, but if we are in the church, we have to live up to Jesus' standard. And so that's why I'm talking about this particular incident 
where Jesus is almost, where he is arrested, and there's violence that could have been much worse. Malchus has his ear cut off by Peter. Now, there, there are four different versions of this, and all of them are pretty much the same, but there are minor details which vary. And that's a good thing, actually. It's, the Gospels are not contradicting each other. Seminary classmate of mine was a homicide detective in Dallas for many years before he accepted the call to become a priest in the Episcopal Church. And he said when they rolled up on a scene, if there were a group of witnesses who were telling the exact same story, the investigators knew that they were lying and that they were trying to put something over on the police. But when you have a similar event, but then different little details emerge and it weaves this tapestry, then you can get the full story. And so what we have here is an incident where violence starts, but with Luke's Gospel, page 858. Here's another, another little, and I know it's a different situation, but it applies. I think it applies. Can we put this into law? I don't know. But I do think we need to have it in our hearts, because that's where the change is really going to begin, right here. Whether a law is on the books or not, this is what matters. And so what happens in this incident, this is Luke chapter 22, verse 50. And this, this is the violence that I've been talking about. Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. But, and here we go, Jesus said, no more of this. No more. Stop it. And he just doesn't say stop it. Look what Jesus does next. He reached out his hand. And he touched the ear. He touched Malchus's ear and healed him. This is why we're here, brothers and sisters. It is a messy world. And our politicians are going to argue and God, I hope they come up with something. They've got to try something. They can't just stand there. Although they might. But what we're supposed to do at base level to catalyze our nation is to relay the words of Jesus when he sees violence happening Especially violence that's being aided and abetted by his followers. Jesus says, stop it. And then he steps forward, he reaches out his hands, and he begins the healing process. May we have the grace to embody Jesus' advocacy and his healing touch. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.